Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a closer look at the Fujinon XF. This is the 16 to 55 millimeter f2.8, and so it is the standard zoom portion of their you know fast wide aperture. Um, Zoom Trilogy here or Trinity and so um, I already have taken a look at the build and the design in my first look episode and so if you missed that I'd recommend that you take a look at that episode here it will give you an idea of the feature set that's there and what you have to work with today however we're here to break down the image quality itself and to see how the lens holds up optically and so without further ado, we're going to jump in. We're going to do a little bit of a comparison to you know, a full frame uh, comparison equivalent. In this case, the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8 on a Sony full frame body. So we'll take a look at how the two lenses compare. Right now, they're fairly close in price. And so um, you know, two different approaches and probably two different ways that people might shop and compare. And so we'll jump in and we'll take a look. So let's start by taking a quick look at how images look when they arrive to you um, in post. What we can see is um, obviously vignette is you know nicely corrected for, so we've got a nice even illumination across the frame uh, due to the in-camera magic. But what we can see is that there is definitely some distortion that escapes correction, and so you've got a fairly pronounced uh, bulge of barrel distortion that you can see there in this top line. If we jump over to a real world image here that I took while in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, uh, you can see on the, you know, the very straight horizon line or what should be a very straight horizon line of the Atlantic Ocean, you can see that the same issue is there. And so, uh, you know, if, if you're in a situation where having absolutely straight lines at 24 millimeters is going to matter to you, you're probably going to need to do some correction of that in post. Now, right now, you can get the uh, Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8 for full frame for you know about the same price. It's about twenty dollars cheaper at the current moment with the Fuji on sale than what the Fuji is, and so it's a somewhat comparable lens. And I think that really people that are looking at something like a Fuji XT3, they're more likely to be cross shopping it with a Sony A7 III than say a Sony A6500 or something similar. Now, I don't have an a7 III, unfortunately, which would have been the even better comparison because then you're closer in price. So I did use a Sony a7 R3, which is what I personally own. But what I did here is I reduced the size of the Tamron images to the resolution of the X-T3 to give you an idea. Now, um, I will note also that, you know, before we look at any of these comparisons, and I'm just going to add in the f 2.8 wide open comparisons from the Tamron um, rather than anything further than that. But I do want to point out one thing and that is that the Fuji goes both wider, it's a 24 millimeter equivalent compared to 28 millimeters. It also goes a little bit longer, about 84 millimeters equivalent compared to 75 millimeters but it is roughly similar, a focal length. But I just do want you to note that the Fuji is managing a little bit longer a focal range or uh, you know, a, a zoom range, I should say. And so that should be taken into account here. Now, what we see looking at the center of the frame is that both of these lenses are extremely sharp in the center of the frame. And I would say that there is a mild edge to the Fuji um, when it comes to center of the frame sharpness and contrast. It looks really uh, fantastic there. However, if we move off to the side, the uh, Tamron shows that it has a much stronger edge performance. And so a, a more even uh, distribution of sharpness across the frame, and you can see up into the extreme corners. But particularly if you're looking like mid-frame area, look how much sharper the Tamron is further out than what the uh, Fuji is. Other advantage here for the Tamron is that it has a little bit less uh, distortion as well. Um, and that's, of course, it also doesn't have as wide a focal length. Now, if we stop down the Fuji to X4 or F4 and compare it to F2.8, we can see center of the frame, there's really not a whole lot uh, of difference to be seen. Um, if we look out towards edge of the frame, what we can see is that the uh, sharpness profile continues out just a little bit further. However, we still have not cleaned up the corners completely. There's a little bit more resolution a little farther out, but the extreme corners are still, you know, a little bit soft. 
Moving on down to F5.6, we see a, again, a mild amount of, of improvement, but not a complete corner sharpness at uh, 16 millimeter. Even at F8, we still don't have uh, tack sharp corners. They're a little bit better, but uh, you know there is still a little bit room of room there for improvement. Now, while I haven't actually um, reviewed yet the 16 millimeter f1.4, I wouldn't be surprised to find that it delivers a little bit stronger corner performance uh, than what the zoom does. And so, you know, if absolute performance in the corners is your priority, you might want to look at one of the prime lenses uh, instead of the zoom. Um, the zoom we can see is great. I mean, just fantastic in the center of the frame and probably about over two thirds of the frame, but the extreme corners at 16 millimeter or 24 millimeter equivalent never get super sharp. So if we move to the 22, 23 millimeter range, you know, roughly 35 millimeter range on full frame, uh, here's what we find. In the center of the frame, both lenses really are exquisitely sharp. And you can see that the uh, Tamron is sharper than what it was at 28 millimeters at 35. Uh, and probably has a little bit more micro contrast. It's just got a little bit more pop on the textures. Moving off to the side of the frame, there is, uh, the Fuji is a much better job of maintaining an even sharpness profile. And so now I don't really see any kind of real advantage for the Tamron off the edge of the frame. And both lenses look fairly similar, which is to say really quite good at 35 millimeters. Stopping on down to F4 shows a mild, mild amount of improvement in the middle. It's already exceptionally good, just a little bit of additional contrast. Moving off to the edge of the frame, uh, we find that there's just a, there is a little bit stronger resolution off the edges, a little bit better contrast. We've got a, a very strong performance here already and it is you know, mildly improved at F4. F5.6 gives us another, again, a very, very mild boost of corner contrast and sharpness. And I looked on at F8 and it's no better than F5.6. And so um, here at 35 millimeters or you know 23 millimeters is gonna be the marker on your lens. Um, you're, you're pretty much getting optimal sharpness in at F4 to F5.6 and no need to stop on down for resolution sake. Now at 34 millimeters or you know around 50 millimeters on a full frame, we can see at the center of the frame, the uh, Fuji is a little bit softer at this focal range, kind of somewhere in the middle. It loses a little bit of the pop. It's still good, but you can see that the Tamron is noticeably better. It's, it's incredibly sharp and contrasty in the center of the frame, even at f2.8. If we move off to the side of the frame, um, there's less of an advantage for the Tamron. Both lenses look pretty much similar. And so while the center of the frame is not as sharp as what we've seen um, on the Fuji, we've seen that it also has a really even profile here at around 34, 35 millimeters. Um, whereas the, the Tamron is super sharp in the center and you know comparatively loses a little bit along the edges. Now here for the first time, we see a real improvement stopping down to F4 in the center of the frame. You can see that there is a, a pretty marked uptick of resolution in the center of the frame and contrast also has increased. At the edge of the frame, there is a mild improvement, but it's not as notable as what it was in the center. Um, along the edge, this is a very, very strong performance, but as you can see, it's not as, as observable a big uptick. What you can see though is there's better resolution. The brighter portion is brighter here, and so a little bit stronger performance. Moving on to f5.6 uh, makes really very, very little difference. Um, it's, I, I think there is a, there's a fraction more resolution there, but you know, again, once again, at 34, 35 millimeters, if you're shooting at f4 to f5.6, you're achieving pretty much peep peak sharpness across the frame. And again, I tested at f8 and I didn't see any improvement over f5.6. Now, finally, at the end of the focal range, uh, first of all, you'll see that at 55 millimeters or around 84 millimeter equivalent, there's definitely, uh, it's framing tighter than what the Tamron is at 75 millimeters. Um, and so, I mean, you definitely have a, a focal range advantage, a zoom range advantage, I should, should say. In the center of the frame, both lenses are really fantastically sharp um, at f2.8. They both look great. And, and I don't know that one looks better than the other. They just both look fantastic. 
off the side of the frame. They seem to have a fairly similar uh, fall off to where they're both quite good, but not as amazingly sharp as in the center of the frame, but not a whole lot of drop off. Looks like the Fuji has retained a little bit more contrast if you look in the grout area there than what the Tamron has. Stopping down to F4 in the extreme corner, you can see that we've got a little bit of a brighter result, a little better uh, contrast in general. That being said, there's, there's only a very, very mild uptick in resolution. And so you're already getting a very strong performance at f2.8. It's only mildly better at f4. Stopping on down to f5.6 shows once again a little bit of improvement, not a significant amount, but a little bit better uh, contrast and a little bit more resolution. Um, you can see that a little bit more mid-frame and then down towards the bottom, you can see a little bit stronger performance. And so once again, um, you do get a little bit of improvement. Usually throughout most of the focal range around f5.6 is going to represent peak sharpness in terms of evenness across the frame. But as you can see, the lens is pretty sharp at f2.8 other than around 35 millimeters. It's sharp in the center of the frame at, at basically any aperture value. Now, if you go into 55 millimeters and the minimum focus distance of around 30 centimeters or right under 12 inches, um, you can achieve a 0.16 times magnification, which does lag a little bit behind some of the competitors. Uh, it still is useful. This represents minimum focus value for you here. So you can see on this orchid, you can fill um, you know, a fairly good portion of the frame with the blossom itself, but it's not going to be confused with a true macro type lens. Now, if we take a look at a few different bokeh kind of shots here, uh, what we can see is that, I mean, as you can see, the lens actually does a pretty fabulous job of uh, transition between sharpness. You know, and if we look in at these images, there's a lot of sharpness on the plane of focus. Um, great contrast there. And then a fairly soft uh, defocused background. So taking a look here, um, you can see that there is, you know, some inner lining there, uh, but the, the bokeh even here at this range is, is pretty reasonable. And looking off the side of the frame, we've still got not bad uh, circular shaping there. Looking over on this side, you can see a little bit of, of deformation, but overall, I would say that the bokeh quality in these images looks fairly nice. And this image, which is more just about defocus, you can see that, you know, our out of focus areas on this pier, um, you know, there's not too many hard edges there. You can see some lines, but overall, I think that it's melted away to defocus fairly well. Once again, great um, resolution and sharpness on our, our subject there. And so, I mean, really for a, a zoom lens, I, I think that this is a fairly strong performance. Now, if obviously these kinds of standard zooms are going to be used for a lot of things, a lot of general purpose type shots. And so, I mean, we've already noted that the lens does have a little bit of an issue with um, some distortion. In real world shooting, um, you know, it's going to depend what you're shooting and where it's positioned at. What you can see is that, I mean, obviously beautiful resolution for this kind of shot. A great color. You know, if we look into this this range, I mean, throughout the the image itself, there's good sharpness. Looking at the image on our right, um, you know, composed vertically, you know, there's there doesn't appear to be too much of a bulge in the lines here. And so, I mean, obviously, th this is not a tilt shift lens. You're going to get some leaning effect, as we can see. But generally, I think the image itself looks looks pretty great. And so, I mean. If, you're, if your goal is general purpose shooting and not like specialized type work, I mean, you can shoot pretty much anything with this lens, but it's not going to be at the top of the heap when it comes to actual architecture. Now in this image, I added a circular polarizer. You can see, you can see that the sky really has that you know, polarized effect, which in this case, I think has produced a you know, pretty cool image here. Once again, looking at lines, I mean, you know, there, there's lots of lines in the image, but the nature of buildings like this is that it comes off quite well. I mean, with our brick wall, it was, you know, it was a little bit of a tougher scenario um, because those lines are more apparent. So again, it's going to depend on what you're shooting, but for for general purpose travel type images. I mean, I love this shot. I think it did a great job. Now this lens gets strong marks from me for, um, for its color rendition. And so I've done no post to this other than I have an import preset that uh, utilizes the classic chrome look, 
but I mean, I think really, really nice uh, color rendition. I like the uh, tones in the water and the various textures there and uh, the, you know, the grasses and the dunes, everything looks nice there. So, I mean, a strong performance on this image, really like that. Here's a more of a still life type image. And you can see that we have nice degrees of saturation and contrast in images you know, without appearing oversaturated or overdone. And so I'm quite happy with the lens when it comes to that. Here's another image. Uh, this is using a circular polarizer. So a couple of things I wanna show for this. Once again, we've got, you know, once again, we've got really good contrast. And so you can see how, you know, contrasty the dark shadow looks against the sand. Good there. Looking over here at the actual um, ocean, you know, and all of these kind of bright contrast edges, I find that chromatic aberrations are pretty well controlled with this lens. I didn't really see an issue with them um, that was notable to me at anything that I looked at in my, you know, just for general purpose type shooting. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with its control of chromatic aberrations as well. Now, when it comes to flare resistance, uh, here's what it looks like stop down. That also gives you a look at the uh, sunburst effect. And so, I mean, the sunburst is okay. It's, it's a little bit busy maybe. It's not my favorite, but it, it's not bad either. It's gonna work for most images. What we can see here on the left side is that contrast is obviously held up quite well. No real issue with flare artifacts, ghosting effects, and so a fairly good one stop down. On this right side, we've got a wide open with a very bright you know, sun effect there. So what we can see is we've got some generalized veiling um, at the place where the, the sun is in the frame, but in a fairly artistic way. So I don't think I'm really complaining there. We've got a bit of a ghosting artifact here, kind of a prismatic um, haze, but or a prismatic blob of, of color there, but not too bad. Here's a shot obviously right into the sun. However, the sun at at dawn, it's a little less intense. It's a little easier for most lenses to handle, but obviously the lens has handled it beautifully here. Once again, I did use a circular polarizer to deepen colors. I'm really, really pleased with the end result though. Beautiful color and you know, the sun has been handled. This is at F4. The sun has been handled really quite nicely in this. Now, of course, the nature of the focal range means we can go from a landscape shot like we just saw to doing portraits. And it's, you know, you buy these lenses for the versatility and it is a very, very versatile lens. So once again, we're shooting into the sun here, backlit subject. Two different approaches, as you can see, and one I've exposed more for the subject and left some room to raise them more. I had a, just a little tiny onboard flash. I don't have a lot of Fuji gear and so I had the little add-on flash from Fuji and so it's not enough to really really um, you know help to illuminate the subject to balance the ratio so I've had to you know fudge it a little bit here but what you can see is that um, it does a beautiful job with the color um, you know skin tones look nice over on the right side I've you know I've exposed more for the scene itself with the idea of silhouette, silhouetting the subject. So, you know, here just gives you an eye of two idea of two different approaches to the same kind of scene. But in both looks, I'm really happy with the end result. Here we've got more of a side lit subject and you can see that the lens really is done a beautiful job. Our skin tones look nice and natural. Lots of detail in the hair there. And then looking off towards the, you know, defocused background, it's done a nice job. So a very useful portrait lens as well. It's just a very versatile lens in general. So as you can see, there is a lot of good stuff that's going on here in the optical performance from the XF 16 to 55 millimeter F 2.8. Of course, this isn't a new lens. A lot of people are already familiar with it. It is a well-loved lens, and it's, it's clear the reasons why. So while it is on the physically larger size, and certainly there are smaller alternatives available, but this delivers a really strong performance throughout the focal range with a little bit of a drop-off in the center of the frame at 35 millimeters at f2.8, but it picks right back up at f4. Outside of that, though, there's a really strong performance in the center of the frame 
throughout the focal range. However, at 16 millimeters, it never quite gets pin sharp in the corners. And so if your priority is the 16 millimeter portion of the frame, you might want to look at one of the wide angle primes from Fuji instead. Um, and because uh, it might give you a little bit stronger performance there. Overall, however, uh, the images look really fantastic out of this lens. It has such versatility, has such great pop when it comes to the color and the contrast. Um, and, you know, frankly, there's very little that you can't do with a lens like this. Um, it delivers, you know, a really strong performance. There is a bit of barrel distortion at 16 millimeters, and that does show up in, in some kind of settings like, you know, the images we saw of the, you know, the skyline, the horizon line over the ocean to where there's a little bit of a bulge that's showing up there. But in a lot of other shots where you don't have a straight line right near edge of the frame, it's, it's not really all that noticeable. Um, flare resistance is good as noted color rendition and even bokeh quality is really quite good. It works well as a landscape lens. In our final episode, we'll take a little bit more at video performance and auto uh, autofocus performance and how those aspects carry out. But at the same time, I mean, we're seeing a lot of really encouraging things to go along with a very robust, you know, pro grade build, as we saw in our first episode, complete with weather sealing and, uh, you know, linear motors for focus. A lot of good things that have gone into this lens. So stay tuned for my wrap up episode, which will be the final one in the series. And we'll look at those things as well as giving you a summation of uh, my opinion of the lens and also give you a look at a few more photos. In the meantime, if you'd like to take a look at my lens image gallery, I've got a lot of great photos there from this lens. Um, and so I'd recommend that you take a look at that. There's a link in the description down below. And there all are also buying links. At the time of this review, Fuji has a fairly deep rebate going on across a, a big part of their lineup. So right now you can get this lens for 899 US, which is about $300 off of the typical price. And so it's, you know, if you're interested in buying it, this is a good time to do it. And there are buying links there. You can also follow me on social media, including now on Instagram. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter or become a patron and get early previews at upcoming content. And beyond that, of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.